a lot of you know, but um, we unfortunately lost Betty Robinson, who was a huge, huge um, local activist, and um, she just played a really, really big role. Um, but we wanted to kind of have a moment of silence for her. Um, she was a longtime and treasured member of the BRJA family and community, um, and we wanted to send some love and light to her family and let them know that we're thinking of them and that we, we definitely, um, you know, will miss Betty. Um, we can recommit to living our lives with similar spirit by remembering to always learn, to always advocate for racial justice, and to always be ready to grab some joy. So I'm going to ask you all to, um, for a moment of silence, welcome me in a moment of silence for Betty. Okay, I thank you guys for joining with me, Beth. Um, before, um, so now we're actually we're gonna get started. So we are um, here today to talk about the kind of elephant in the room, which is voting. So before we get started on the actual topic, I wanna do some panel intros. Um, first, I'm going to have Tasman um, from Baltimore Votes introduce herself and share a little bit about what she does. Um, hi, thank you so much, Julia. So I'm Tasman. I'm the director of programs at Baltimore Votes. Uh, Baltimore Votes is working towards a future where every person in every precinct votes in every election. Um, and all of our work is grounded in community collaboration and celebration. So part of the inspiration is making voting fun, making it something that is a celebration, not a chore that you have to do. Um, and we believe that that helps to bring people into the process, make them feel confident um, and make them feel like, you know, it's not, it's not just something that they have to check off a list or feel guilty about um, whether they do it or not, but that it's a real community building event. Um, and then Ian, of course, was one of our founders, so he'll probably say something uh, about his role in getting no <coughs> Baltimore started. So huge thanks to him, of course, and Sam Novi for giving me a job uh, eventually. Um, and then apart from my work at Baltimore Votes, I also am a plain language consultant with the Center for Civic Design. Um, so in that role, I work nationally um, on making small changes to everyday things like the mail-in ballots or websites and you know legalese language that surrounds voting and civics and making it more accessible to people so that you know everyday people it's easier to make a good decision it's easier to get involved and like vote or um, be part of the civic engagement process. And it's not such a um, like unintentional hurdle by having to you know, pull out a dictionary every time you have to read your uh, you know, voter's declaration, the oath that you're signing on the, um, on the envelope. So I'll talk more about that probably later, but pass it back to you, Julia, thank you. All right, thank you. And next we have Ian from No Boundaries Coalition. And you can introduce a little bit about yourself, Ian. Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks. Thank you all for uh, having me as well. And uh, thanks for the little plug, uh, Tasman. Um, definitely uh, formerly with Baltimore Votes, but still a part of Baltimore Votes. Um, but right now, I'm uh, technically the title, my title is, I just hate giving up my title, but it is Director of um, Civic Culture and Youth Programs. Because I, I guess when I started, I was, I felt like I'm just an organizer. Um, and I just am doing do the work. So, uh, but I do run our youth organizing program. So we have a program for 13 to 19 year olds um, and they learn everything about uh, community organizing, um, careers and college majors that are associated with community organizing and civics and different things like that. And then we, uh, in the civic culture program, we do everything around 
civic engagement. But the reason that we added culture or changed it to culture is because we really try to um, do a lot of different things that embed uh, community engagement in um, you know residents' lives, everyday lives. So we have a Black Captains program. We do a census and uh, do census and voter engagement outreach, as well as voter education. Um, like we do Civic Saturdays, uh, first and third Saturdays, and that actually won't stop after the election. Um, so that's uh, something that we've been f trying to do for a long time. And um, just to keep it short and sweet, because I'm sure I'll talk more about it down the line. But um, yeah, those are primarily uh, what I do at No Boundaries. We also are in food and food justice. So we operate a fresh produce market at the Upton Avenue stall, up the, at the Upton Avenue market on Pennsylvania and Lawrence. Um, we also are online, so if you are in that close to that area, 21217, and you're looking for fresh produce, uh, you can sign up and get your produce delivered to you, or you can come pick it up. So I had to plug that, but yes. <laughs> That's all I have. Well, thank you um, for those, those intros. So just do a little bit of grounding about like why we are here. So um, as you all know, I'm sure we've all been bombarded with the election, um, the presidential election that is consistently and constantly on our TVs, getting mailers, um, getting text messages from random numbers. Um, and so that kind of brought up a lot of conversation just about like voting is really kind of touted as the end all be all way of civic engagement. Like, you know, when there's an issue, a lot of the time we just hear, you know, go vote. Like, well, you know, if you don't vote, your voice doesn't matter at all. Um, and so, I mean, there are, obviously there are some, you know, um, some very interesting thoughts around that idea. And so we really want to just kind of talk about, like now with this election coming up um, and we're ending next week and um, all the things that we see that have changed over the last four years nationally or even just in your own communities, um, what are some ways that we can think beyond voting and thinking beyond the ballot box? Because that can't be the only way that change is possible, um, especially in a world that is ever changing and ever growing um, and new ideas are being formed. So I just kind of want to start um, just talk, you know, talking with like Taz and Ian and also, and also Michelle, I'm going to put her out there, um, just about some of the, like the history of like, you know, what we're seeing with voting and civic engagement. Where do we think that these kind of like ideas about voting and going beyond voting have, you know, come from? Where are we now with it? Sorry, I was on mute. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, his, his, I want not to go all the way back historically, right? But just to, um, one article that I remember just thinking about me really starting my work uh, at Baltimore Votes um, yeah, and really just getting into civic engagement. Um, it really was just getting, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Somebody came to my house, kind of threw me off. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, almost lost my train of thought. But just thinking about um, how the media can perpetuate certain things, sometimes it kind of comes from like just the, the articles that get posted or um, what uh, someone reports on an area that is not turning out or anything like that. Um, and then also from actual events um, that, that do happen. So uh, I know, I'm gonna say Tasman, I think you're gonna talk a little bit more about specific events but um, just thinking about the history and where they where it comes from is those actual events. And then, you know, it gets out into the media. So a journalist might write about it and it takes on life of its own. So I just wanted to kind of start with that and thinking about historically where the term comes from, because historically voter suppression comes from, I mean, civics, I'm sorry, I didn't jump the gun, but historically, obviously civic engagement, I really see comes from like the uh, civil rights movement and I like one of the biggest things Sam always talks about is like how radical it was to um, register specifically like black people to vote in the 60s um, and that and it really being a need to do those things with everything going on in the 60s right uh, even the 40s 50s to where um, folks really couldn't vote um, like they were really being discriminated against so that's that's historically you know kind of 
in my opinion, where it started to come from is like, oh no, we need to get civically engaged at that term. And um, I could also, uh, there's probably other ways that it evolved, but definitely in that 60s era, era of um, really getting folks active, activated so they didn't get their rights back. Um, I know historically grounding us in that. And then um, Tasman, you can stop me um, if you like, but. <laughs> No, no need to stop you. I think everything you're saying is like a great historical context to frame the conversation. I mean, going way, way, way back, like to the founding of the US, you know, we were supposedly founded as a democracy, but of course, the ma vast majority of people living inside the, you know, US boundaries were not able to vote. Um, like it was a very small, portion that was included in that we the people. Um, and then throughout the US's history, there have been, you know, one movement after another of trying to increase, like, the number of people who are able to vote and access to the vote. Um, and, you know, as Ian was talking about with the civil rights movement, that being a real turning point where for the first time, um, especially black people, uh, people of color were actually for like, you know, after the civil war, supposedly like on paper, granted the right to vote. And then mm -hmm. another hundred years of, mm, this isn't really working. What's like, <laughs> what laws are in place? Like how are how is voter suppression continuing to happen over those, you know, 100 years? Um, so it's really only since the civil rights movement that we've had some semblance of, you know, full access. Mm -hmm. um, and even then, like moving forward, we've seen waves of uh, voter suppression, um, both by law and um, unofficially, and the fight for full enfranchisement of the country is still definitely going on. I mean, we see news articles every day about um, like right now in this uh, election of uh, people either gaining or losing access to the vote based on um, state policies, based on Supreme Court cases. So it's an mm -hmm. ongoing, ongoing fight for sure. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think I think it started during Reconstruction because oh. they wiped out every major uh, improvement that Black folks made, and so they were going to make sure that that didn't happen again. So we have to go back to understand Reconstruction to understand just what inroads were made in terms of voting, education, Black folks being a part of the uh, sheriffs, uh, Congress, and all these things. We don't talk enough about Reconstruction. We, we talked mm -hmm. about what happened with Wall Street and the things in the, in the red summer of Oklahoma, but we need to let folks know what happened during Reconstruction and how that was uh, the setup to suppress even more. Because really, uh, based on the uh, origin of this country, it wasn't supposed to be everybody have a vote. You know, they used the word democracy to make it sound noble, but it really wasn't noble because it excluded women, people of color, Native Americans, so it really wasn't noble. And people without property. Uh, yes. Yeah. And even people who did not hold property. So this whole notion of uh, keep saying democracy this and democracy that, it has never really been practiced in full. And we're seeing it even more now with the voting suppression. Yeah. And um, well, that's all. Yeah, thank you. No, really, yeah, I'm I'm about to say I'm so glad. That's it's so funny. Um, when I, we asked Julia, like, what do you mean by the history of voting? Um, as far as when you wanted to like proposing that question, because I'm with you, like, there's so many different um points that we could look at as far as reconstruction mm -hmm. to um that being the time that you know black men really getting the, the right to vote, right? And then electing, you know, the first black congressman or uh first um I forget it was a senator as well, but and then having to fight for your spot on that um, because you weren't a citizen in the mm -hmm. 1800s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm just I, I think it's crazy in it, and you're right. I'm so glad that you brought that up. That in the 1900s it was a fight, even um, 
to just get everybody civically mm -hmm. engaged. So mm -hmm. that is, but I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that we want to do at No Boundaries. It is nowhere mm -hmm. near in the works. Um, I mean, nowhere near finished, but mm -hmm. we're really trying to do, go all the way back. Like right now I have a voting history wall that goes from 1776 all the way up until now when it talks about 18 year olds getting the right to vote. Um, but actually talking about some of those individual battles like in Florida, um, the first black man elected to, I think it was Senate. And then um, was it, um, was it? Smalls. I, I just been doing this research, collecting all of this stuff. So Robert Smalls. I, 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 yes, Robert Smalls, first black man, mm -hmm. first elected to Congress. So mm -hmm. all of those different things, like we definitely need to know. Um, and I think uh, we we're about to get into it, but I think one of the biggest things too is voter discouragement, um, as well as mm -hmm. like as a form of suppression, even back then. And saying like, even though you got elected, like, oh, you're not a citizen yet. Um, so it's all of these different things that can be applied to um, the history of voting. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, but the history of voting um, to me is also oh. connected to the history of education in this country. It wasn't for mm. one. Okay, it was not designed to be for everyone. Women, absolutely. Women on the Native American. It was not designed. So when you have volumes of those disenfranchised people coming in, they're gonna try all kinds of things to keep the numbers down. That, I mean, that's basically what it is. So in education and government and, and all these areas that make up systemic racism has to be looked upon as it's too many people coming up. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank you because like, that actually kind of helps us get to our next topic of voter suppression. Um, obviously that is a huge topic and an, um, an issue of concern that we see um, going back, you know, before um, with like, you know, as, as people were talking about with um, reconstruction up to now, um, ways that they try to take the vote away from specific groups or people. Um, and so that's when we see continue. We see that with um, the elections and, you know, our state elections, our local elections and other states. Um, so I think that it's a really important topic. Um, how do we actually combat or what are ways that we combat voter suppression um, and what are some ways that we can make sure that people are educated um, on the issue so they're actually you know going out if they choose to vote i'm going to put this to our panelists i taught in schools how can our children learn if it's oh. taught in schools oh. That, that's just what I'm saying. The system of education mm -hmm. here in America is it's not about us. It's not about keeping us informed or intelligent about things. So when you, we're sending our kids to these schools, they are not bringing these things up. So it's to me, it's up to parents. It's up to, I'm saying me as a parent, I've always had all kinds of books, tapes, and movies and stuff like that. And my children had to sit down and look at it because they needed to understand what world they were walking into. So that's why I said this whole thing is linked to education also. It's not for everyone. It's not to make everyone enlightened. So, you know, civics, they took it out of school. Mm -hmm. so, so Music. Education, yeah. um, that's a really interesting topic with so much to get into. Some of you are probably aware of uh, in Rhode Island just last week, there were a group of students who had um, taken a case to the courts uh, saying that Rhode Island um, was violating their constitutional rights uh, because Rhode Island as a state did not provide public school students with adequate civic education um, and that violated their constitutional rights to be prepared citizens to be jurors and to vote, um, etc. So uh, and just last week, the, I think a federal circuit court um, ruled against the students and said that the constitution does not uh, require that public schools equip students with the skills they need to be civically engaged individuals. So that, uh, the judge also did like in the ruling state that like that's a problem and but it's not something mm -hmm. for the politics, that's something for uh state legislators 
to fix or the like local school systems. Um, but what we have seen over the last number of decades is the erosion of civic education in schools, um, taking away civic classes, maybe some of the um, anyone who was in school, the school system a couple of decades ago probably had an actual civics class of some mm -hmm. sort. Today, most students okay. don't have civics. Like in Maryland, we're one of the few states where high school students are required to have one year of um, US government and history at, in high school. Uh, but many, many school systems across the country don't have that requirement or maybe it's only a semester so there like there has been a um there has been an erosion of civic education um and there that like has come at the expense of uh, or like, sorry, social studies, civics, history courses have been uh, taken away in order to make more time for ELA, English language arts classes or math courses mm -hmm. or math courses. Um, when in fact, social studies, at least in like elementary school, there's uh, studies show, I don't know exactly the studies, uh, but I can find them and link them later. Um, studies have shown that at least at elementary school, uh, increasing the amount of time that students spend studying social studies actually has a much larger increase in their reading levels than just teaching reading on its own because it gives them content to be, um, to like get interested in and to like hook on to. So despite research evidence <laughs> that um, social studies, which encompasses civics um, in many, or could encompass civics, um, many school systems still aren't doing that. They're looking at you know, ELA and math on their own. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I won't, I won't go on about that, but that's a, that's a major. Thank um, you. This, yeah, thank you so much. Just to let everyone know, um, our chat box is open for questions. There is going to be a question and answer portion of this event. So if you have any questions or comments, um, please hold them until then. And also you can put them in the group chat um, so we can make sure that we are monitoring that and answering and getting to your actual questions. Um, Ian, was there anything that you wanted to ask? I know that you are actually working on, you guys have a pretty good landscape of what's happening currently with voter suppression um, or getting people out to vote um, in certain in specific areas. Um, I know like some of the some of the things that I've actually heard from people uh, is that you know it's it's like individuals to kind of doing um, voter suppression and uh, discouragement, like letting people mm. know on a one on one or phone call or email. Like um, I had someone, a friend of mine, literally tell me like his grandmother got a call from someone in Florida talking about her vote didn't matter and she even though she already voted. And those those things, and she was thinking about going back to vote to make sure that her vote did count. And and um, we had to tell her like, no, you're you're, you're fine. That as a, a a scam call, but it's it's to get people because if you go and you you try to vote twice, your your your, your count won't matter. So it's a lot of individuals. I call them sometimes crazy people, just doing whatever they feel like they can they can to kind of discourage you to go vote, um, or uh kind of make you go out of your way or something like that. So just to get that out of the way, and that's an antidotal story. So maybe it's, that's not happening all over the place, but um, I do know that it is happening um, somewhat. And no, but there's real, there's articles, you can look it up. Um, this happened in 2018, where, because uh, just like if you're working on a campaign, you can get voter access network, you can get access to people's files, so can the other team, um, what, whichever team you're playing on, if you're playing on the team. Um, they can do the same. And sometimes they do go through and try to discourage people from, from doing those different things, uh, as well as putting it out in the media. Um, like I know people that I've heard people literally still telling felons in Baltimore that they can't vote. Yeah. Like I've walked, been walking down the street and, um, oh, what are you doing? You can't vote. Keep walking. No. And I had to stop them. No, you can vote. So whether they were doing it on purpose to discourage them or they just didn't, they were misinformed. Um, but we have to be able to combat misinformation. 
Yeah. Um, those different things happen every day on the street. Uh, like from people while the reason why we're we're taking people to vote on Saturday is because in our communities in 21217, you walk around and ask people to vote, or are, did you do your mail-in ballot? Oh, I don't trust that. Who knows where they're getting it from? But that's how they feel. So I now have to, you know, you gotta either tell convince them or help them feel confident about the mail-in process, or you'll say, no, let's let's make a voting plan to take you down there. Um, so it's about really combating the misinformation as well as uh, discouraged and disenfranchised uh, voters. So I guess to the other point of, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but um, the, the woman that was speaking uh, earlier um, um, very passionately, I think it is a combination of us as parents, concerned citizens, community members to do the education. Um, like in my youth program, it centers around civics. It centers around community engagement. So I'm stepping in that gap for parents that might not be teaching their children the importance of voting or importance of going to a community association meeting. So I, I think it's a both end of like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yes, if you're a parent that has a child to do that. But it's also up to us, too, to advocate to these public schools. Like, no, we, we got to have a civics curriculum. This, these are the things that um, we want our graduates to have. Uh, and then also being the person that can go into the school and teach it. Um, they can also, you know, everybody has a, and I'm talking even on the elementary school level, like we really, um, we've, we've begun those talks like at Santown Winchester Achievement Academy. I, I went in there um, before the primary election and just talked to their students and asked them, has, does anybody in their household talk about voting to fifth graders? And of course it wasn't, it was maybe like, oh yeah, some people use the term surprise, but I don't like to use that term because it's, it's nice for me to know there was like 60, 40 in there. Like 40% were like, oh no, nobody in my house talks about voting. And maybe 60% 60, 60 was like, yeah, my grandmother's voted or you know has gone voting. And um, those are the type of conversations that we really got to even open up to. So that's what, like, I was a community member, just walked in there and said, hey, teacher, can I talk about voting? I read, and then we were able to follow it up in the summer by reading a, a book called Grace about Grace, running, Grace for President. So if you know any, third to fifth graders, that's a great book to read them, to get them engaged in civics. I mean, to just learn about the election. Um, we talk, and I'm gonna say it's good for adults because uh, a parent that doesn't know anything about it is gonna learn about the electoral college in there. And I'm like, that's how they think, that's how they do that? Because the kids, like they go through the whole process of it. So it's, it's about really bridging that gap for everyone. Cause there's also parents that don't know it either. Like I'm walking down the street, talking to 30, 40 year olds too, telling them, the importance of it and they're also saying not maybe maybe not older than 50 sometimes but between that like 25 to like 30 40 some some young parents they're like oh i didn't learn that either um and i gotta say oh, all right come to a civic saturday maybe come to the block captains program so not only do you learn about how the president gets elected or what the president does or senate does um you also there's a pick that like i'm my goal is for our next black captain thing is to have the pictures of all my city council members in our zip. Um, because like I said, I have a voting wall. It gets busy in my office too. So it's a project I'm working on. But so as soon as you walk in my office, you can just see that because oftentimes people are like, I, I never even thought about that. I don't know what city council person does. So just having that as a constant conversation. And that's why we, we call it culture. It's not just civic engagement, but it's civic culture. It's like, this is the culture that we're trying to create to where folks, um, you know what I mean? This is their first thought to go to. And I say like, get practice mm -hmm. voting for your community association president. You know, just do it when you got to vote for uh, the actual president, but your neighborhood has a community association president and a committee and all of those things and maybe vote on a project, like get involved on that really local level. And I'm kind of off on a little bit of a tangent. But no, no, man, I think that but, that um, is <laughs> definitely it, yeah. I was, I was gonna jump in and talk about suppression. Thank you, Ian, for talking so much about like how important it is to get involved on a local level because while um, national elections are important, a lot of the things that actually affect us are decided by our local officials. And I think people don't understand that. And I think also people don't understand that, you know, when, when you reach out to one of your local representatives and you send them an email, you give them a phone call, 
they're going to listen because you're the person who puts them in office. Mm -hmm. People need to understand that they have power in that and that they can use their voices. But I wanted to real, really quickly go back to suppression because um, you know I think that what's happening too with with our with our president is that there is this thing of making people feel like their vote doesn't matter, that it's not going to mm -hmm. be needed, that the voting. You know, Ian, you were saying that people were telling you. Um, I'm, I don't trust mailing in my ballot, even though Republicans themselves have been mailing in ballots for generations, right? Like this is a system that they overwhelmingly used and have used prior to the pandemic, right? So I think that that, that is a huge thing that's happening. And when we hear our president say things like um, sending out poll watchers, like that is that is a signal to black people and people of color that <laughs> there's going to be white people out there watching you vote and, and well, like, exactly. talk about reconstruction and, and literally thousands of black people were killed around the time of reconstruction by the KKK and other white militant groups, right? Because Black people were, like Ian said, were voting in Black people into office. These are people who were one generation away from slavery, and now we're in the Senate, right? And so they saw that Black people were coalescing and building power, and they didn't like that. And so they literally started lynching people and scaring people physically with violence from coming to the polls. And so when 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 45 says that, that is what he's signaling. That is what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. Literally scare people with violence or imminent violence by saying we're going to send out poll watchers. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we, there are a lot of ways that suppression is signaled. There's like the, the political policy aspect of it. It's the text messages and phone calls, um, preying on, on vulnerable populations or made vulnerable populations. Um, there is, of course, like the, the education element where people aren't educated about these things. I remember a few years ago, there was like this whole thing about like the wrong voting day going around and it was kind of like well no like we know the voting day but a lot of people can be fooled so i think that suppression is definitely um one of those things and of course that kind of leads to the kind of larger um thing that i'm seeing at least for myself um that the 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 mode of trying to get people to vote has always been particularly around black people um if they didn't if your voice didn't matter then they wouldn't like they wouldn't be trying to take it away like it's, it's that important um and yet we have seen an increase in people who, who have decided they don't actually want to partake in the um in voting um and i know that that is something that a lot of people from various like you know points of view and ideology of course like no judgment here yeah. um but but I know it's definitely something that we're seeing an increase of um, and just like, you know, people deciding not to vote because, and not just, about, not just about suppression, but they feel like the system itself is actually not worth engaging in um, because whether you vote for Democrat or Republican or independent or whatever the case may be, um, a lot of the issues that are supposed to change and shift with that vote, they don't see that as changing or shifting. And so they're kind of just saying, I don't want to deal with it at all. So what do we, or what are ways to engage, if you choose not to vote, what are the ways you can continue to engage to, to make the changes that you want to see? Yeah, um, just to, I, I, I really tell those same folks, cause I talk to them every once in a while, um, to just take it a step, step by step, find something that you are interested in and, and do your best to connect with it. Um, because especially if you are a parent, um, like your children live in this community and you have a say, uh, especially if it's something that you don't like. Uh, and that's why like working at a, a nonprofit, a coalition, um, is, is easy for me to, to make that ask, right? It's like, hey, come to a, a meeting, join a program, um, put your youth in our program or something like that. And, and then of course, when voting season comes around, it's like, all right, you should have the power to vote. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's really first getting them at their level, wherever they are, like maybe they, they can't stand the trash outside on the street. Um, maybe they feel like people speed down their block, maybe um, potholes or something like that. It's like, where can I, I meet you at? Um, maybe you feel like your, your, your child's school is not great. Um, or it could be providing different things. So you kind of got to just meet them where they are first, like whatever's in their face, whatever they feel like is is affecting them. 
and then kind of go that route. And then, you know, gradually just give them more like, oh, that the city council member does have a say over trash pickups for DWP, a Department of Public Works. And this is how you should contact them. And maybe we should get a, you know what I mean? Just suggesting these things so that they can feel uh, like their vote is a part of something else too, right? It's not just, oh, I, I voted for that council member and my street still is, is terrible. But you can you can wrap all of those things up and, and now they know, not only did you vote for that person, but you can go to their office and say, I voted for you. Um, I need you to help me do X, Y, Z. Even if something as small as like, I need my, my, my niece or my nephew, my son to get a scholarship. Do y'all have money? Like we use, we teach our, our students and our uh, adults to you literally get everything you can out of your, your, your local office and then whatever you need from the state ones, they got it too. So it's really about how to leverage your, um, your, your power really in, in, in your organizing capacity as well. So I really try to just tell them to start small, start with something that they, they feel good about and then um, build up from there. So. Okay. All right, Tazin, did you wanna add something? Yeah, just to echo everything Ian is saying. And um, and this starts in schools, it starts in like one-on-one -on -one conversations, but instead of thinking of voting as being the be all and end all way of being engaged and like being a citizen, um, saying that that is one element of it. It's one tool that we can use in all of the other tools that we can use to get involved with our communities. Um, you know, in, in schools, like advocating for, you know, more student voice in the way that schools are run gives, like that creates a different environment in schools, but then also gets students to see like, oh, if I'm part of student council, if, I'm, if I talk about something with my teacher, something changes, um, that, then helps to like little by little build their confidence that they can be change makers in their community. And so that, if someone has that confidence, as Ian is saying, they'll then go on to probably vote, most likely vote, um, but they'll also know that voting is just one thing that they do to contribute to their communities. Absolutely. Um, so one of the other things that we're seeing kind of in um, the news right now. There, like, it's a lot of recent headlines um, about people who are like waiting in line, who are standing in line to vote. And it's like three or four or five hours um, to actually get it done. And I think that kind of also adds to what we were talking about like with the voter suppression, um, that it's seen as inspiring. And I don't know if we should be looking at that as inspiring. So I just kind of wanted to get um, you all, what kind of point of view on that as well? Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's inspiring to know that people have the enthusiasm that they're going to show up, but it's not necessarily a good thing. And it's, it points to systemic problems with uh, the way that this country um, gives people or enfranchises people or, or the right to vote. Um, I mean, I say that like my job should not exist. It's ridiculous that there is a need for an organization like Baltimore Votes with like me going around trying to get people excited about voting. Like if our, to go back to the, the point about civic education, if people just like felt confident about voting and finding information that they needed, like this job would not be necessary. Um, I got a text from a friend of mine who lives in, is German, lives in Germany uh, the other day. And she was like, I just found out that Americans need to register to vote. Is that true? That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, you know, in context or like by comparison for, uh, for Mara in Germany, um, everyone when they're 18 just like yeah. things sent to them in the mail and they have to like just sort of check off and then they're registered like that's the fact that like registering to vote is the very first barrier um is is pretty ridiculous in the u.s um i like 
automatic voter registration was just um, instituted in Maryland that's growing across the country. I just had to go get my uh, driver's license renewed. And when I went in, I had to pay $48 on the spot in order to get my driver's license. Um, and I got a you know, question about, do you wanna update your voter registration, which is great. But if I didn't have that $48, I wouldn't be able to right. like, register at the same time. Um, something that, you know, another problem, this is a little bit tangential, this is kind of on the um, like voter suppression and like ways that our system is broken and putting up barriers, um, getting access to information. Like if, if you have to like go and search out <laughs> getting registered, if you have to go and search out like your polling place because it's closed or changed and um, you haven't been explicitly told, like it, it, there's, there's a gap between um, the, the knowledge that like boards of elections and state legislators have and then the knowledge that like is freely available and publicly available to most people. Um, Tasman, real quick. I was giving somebody a ride to the polls today. It was three women. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're pulling out of the parking lot, like right outside of their building. And they're like, we're voting two blocks away, right? And I said, who told y'all that? I said, we we got to go up Edmondson. And they said, oh, no. Nah. The one lady, super upset. No, let me out. I'm not going all the way up there. I was like, you sure there's nothing I can do? Like, it's only up to, it's not that far. It's two, not two blocks, but it's not that far. No, they told me was, mm -hmm. I was going two blocks the street. She got out of the car. Hopefully she'll go vote, you know, on election day at Booker T. But even that experience could have, you know, just, just discouraged her. And I, I immediately called the person who set this up. And I was like, hey, what are you telling people? Do you know the, the right things? Because I thought I, I thought I told her the, the right information. Sure. So to your point, just the smallest thing of like, that barrier is a discouragement. It is voter suppression. So um, really just making sure, you know, we have the right information for people when they, when they're looking for it. So just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was like, that's, I have a real example because that definitely was just like, I, it, it's, it was, it hurt me. Like, you know what I mean? Cause all three of them, when they got in the car, like, oh yeah, we're about to go vote. We're going to go vote. <laughs> and that quick change, I was like, man, it's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think about this election cycle, this is now the fourth election in Baltimore this year, and it's the fourth time that it's been done in a different way. And that is, it's not on the books voter suppression, but it is not in the same way that we see um, in states that have been like actively uh, dismantling the provisions of the Voter Rights Act of 1965. But this is the unofficial um, way, like it, it is, it's happening. Changing mm -hmm. on people, creating confusion, that creates a, an atmosphere of voter suppression. Um, if In my non-Baltimore votes role for Center for Civic Design, um, one of the things that we work on is making information more accessible to people um, so that when changes happen, because changes happen, like things needed to change because of COVID. I'm not saying that like that's a bad thing, but the problem was that the information about those changes wasn't communicated in a clear, um, trustworthy way, and it wasn't communicated to everyone who needed to find out. Um, so that's where the bigger problem is. Um, Anthony, if you could potentially make it so that I could share my screen, I can show a couple of like quick examples of, um, of how bad design creates this culture or like a, a lack of accessibility to, um, to the voting process and to civic engagement as a whole. Um, I've just built it up like, Quite a bit. Let me. Um, okay. 
So this is a, uh, a county that I worked in in Pennsylvania. This was their Board of Elections uh, website um, over the summer. It's probably a little bit hard for people to see, but like Delaware County, Pennsylvania, Election Bureau, and right at the top, we've got like legal notice, August 20th, Board of Elections meeting right at the top. This is the landing page. When someone from this county looks for, how do I vote in Delaware County? This is where they landed. And then you got like, welcome to the Election Bureau webpage. Um, lots and lots and lots of text where it talks about April 28th, even though this is now August. So totally out of date. If I wanted to go vote in person, there's no way of knowing like, where do I go to vote in person? It's like, a it's looks kind of fine, but it's, it's not a great website. It's hard to find the information you need. If you are someone who has a former felony conviction, uh, you have no idea if you can vote just by like glancing at this. If you are a college student, you have no idea, you know, where to go to find the information. And so um, this website actually was totally revamped a couple of weeks after this based on some notes that like I sent over and they ended up with like six days until the election. Here's some quick facts and then here are links to um, like here's how you where you go to go vote. Here's how you do voter registration. Here's where you vote. So little, I mean, this wasn't little changes. This is like 113 page document in order to revamp the entire website, but like making changes like this, giving visual clues, reducing the number of words makes it much more likely that someone is going to be able to find information instead of like looking at this, getting overwhelmed and then walking away. Um, in, you know, we're talking about mail-in ballots right now. So every state has a totally different mail-in ballot envelope design. Um, and like in Kentucky, there are two places where a voter needs to sign their name. It's like on this one and then on, sorry, my computer, and then on a different envelope, they have to sign twice. And so a voter very easily might skip one or the other. Um, and that in its own way is like a, a tool of voter suppression. Like it's the number of ballots that are invalidated because they missed, you know, one or both of these things. And then we've also got like this text right here that you're signing, but like, what does that oath mean? So, you know, having, um, when you have an oath that looks like this that you're signing, like it's, it's intimidating. Someone doesn't, isn't going to take the time to read it. But if you can have an oath that's this, like in bullet points, and it's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm a US citizen. I meet the requirements. Like I'm registered at the address below. Again, a lot easier. So there are, there are things that can be done to make it easier for people to get the knowledge that they need. And I'm not saying like blaming boards of elections across the country for not having um, the resources, the staff power, the, uh, the money needed to make all of these changes. But there are things that could be done to make it more accessible and make it more trustworthy um, to make those changes. I just went on a long sort of tangent there, but um, yeah, something I think about a lot. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so I actually sent out a, um, it was kind of a, a all call in our chat that we're going to like open it up for questions and answers right now. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, we are looking at the chat to, um, to kind of ask if like, someone just sent me something um, from Eleanor. I'm really into the block captain thing as a way to build community and civic engagement. They have one in their neighborhood. Is No Boundaries doing anything citywide for block captain programs? Um, our block captain program is figuring out um, this as we go. So Ian, that's a question for you. Is, does No Boundaries have any kind of like citywide or is it just like regulated to that particular zip code? Yeah, um, in our mission uh, in 
2007, they set out to uh, to focus on 21217. But um, we do, I, I work with anybody. So like if I have, like, especially after the election, I'll have some, some free time to, to just answer questions. Um, we are going to be convening like a, a feedback session for our past two Black Captain cohorts. And um, that would be something you, you definitely are free to join. Um, yeah, like, so if that's something you're interested in, we could definitely follow up. Uh, but as of right now, No Boundaries does not um, offer any like broad uh, consultation or um, workshops. Cool, cool, cool. So Brian asked, um, how does Maryland compare to other states regarding making it difficult to vote? Like Texas that um, has one voter ballot box for 4.7 million people in the Houston area. So well, how does Maryland match up compared to other states when it comes to the difficulty in voting? In general, Maryland is actually ranked pretty highly. Um, what was really troubling was the uh, change between the primary election and the general election, putting that extra barrier mm -hmm. of the having to request a mail-in ballot that like nationwide is considered a step backwards um, in voter uh, uh, like ease of voting in the state. Um, we are uh, like the, we have online voter registration. We have online mail-in ballot requests. We have a lot of comparatively a lot of drop boxes. You know, when we look at uh, Texas on the other hand, um, you know, we don't have a pretty, like our mail-in ballot envelope and the signature and oath stuff is all pretty accessible. We're one of the only states in the country to have an electronic delivery mail-in ballot, um, which was developed specifically mm. for voters with disabilities in order to use screen reader technology. Um, one of the few states to have that. We can track our mail-in ballots online. About half of the states can do that at the moment. Many others can't. Um, Every, uh, anyone who has uh, completed their period of incarceration for a felony conviction is able to um, re-register to vote. Uh, if you're sitting in jail on pretrial, if you're on parole, if you are serving time for a misdemeanor, you are able to vote in Maryland. That's not the case in all states. Um, mm. We're not as good as, I think it's Vermont where even if you're serving time for a felony conviction, you are still able to vote. So, you know, we're not in the, the top bracket for uh, restoration of rights, but we're better than many other states. Um, so there are a lot of things to applaud about Maryland. There are also things that, you know, we can push for better reform um, and to continue saying like we should we should improve something that I would hope that uh, Maryland looks at more would be uh, ranked choice voting. We haven't really talked about that, but that um, is starting to be a thing in some states in uh, New York, Maine, um, some races in California have ranked choice voting. Um, that would be a great addition to Maryland. Uh, 16 year old voting. We've got a couple of I think Rockville, um, Tacoma Park, one other place, Hyattsville maybe in Maryland has 16 year old voting for like local races, um, hmm. but not statewide. And that's only for local races. So there, there are room for improvement. The Maryland State Board of Elections website could use some improvement. The board hmm for Baltimore City website could use some improvement, um, but we're okay. All right. So um, are there any other questions or comments um, regarding voting or things outside of voting? I think that um, like I said, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest um, studies that I'm seeing now are people who are not voting or why they're choosing not to vote or ways that people can get involved um, outside of the ballot box, because I know that's not the only way. Like I, I've, I've seen just a lot of discussion, like if this person wins and I can breathe easy and everything will be okay. And 
I mean, historically that has been shown not to be true. No matter who was in office, there's usually someone who is, you know, getting the shaft, as they say. Um, so I think that it is important to stay engaged and not just nationally and worrying about the White House, but really like in our local politics um, and then just like in our local communities, like what are things that we can do as citizens? Michelle, I saw that you had unmuted, so I'm wondering if you had anything to say or add. Yeah, it looks like there was a question that was sent in um, uh, to the tech person, but I can go ahead and read it. Kind of piggyback what you just said, Julia, it says democracy wasn't designed to include black and brown people. Some organizers, organizers and activists follow the thought of not participating in a broken system. As a strategy, should we all refrain from participating in elections until racist barriers are removed? Mm. I mean, That's a deep I, one. I like it. I honestly, I honestly don't don't think so. Um, one of my biggest people to look at is Bobby Seale and the Black Panthers. I think his last resort was to actually run for mayor. Um, and I and I always said if they'd have started out with that, they'd have ended up in the office. Um, so it's mostly of, to me about just being more collective um, and then having a strong base. So the more that you base build, you build power in your community wherever you're organizing, the more uh, leverage you have, the more people probably going to want to join you, especially if you have good ideas. Um, so I always, and I'm a, and personally, I'm a both and person. It's like, mm -hmm. why can't we both and? Why can't we organize and build all that power and say, hey, all of those, let's do this and vote for the same person or, you know what I mean? Different things like that. So I just both and, like, why not? No, I agree. Mm -hmm. and I, I just want to piggyback on that. But I agree. I, I think that voting is important. It's not everything. It's not perfect. It's not going to solve all the problems. I think racism and white supremacy is insidious and we have to fight it on every front that we possibly can. And um, uh, so, yeah, so I, yeah, I just definitely agree with that. I, I feel like I was going to add something else, but no, I agree. Ian. We got to do all, all the things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Someone else asked, um, what, can, what can people do, what can people who want to advocate for change and justice, whether it in the election year or not, um, do to truly make a difference? So what do you guys think folks can do to truly make an impact or have an impact um, without an election? Well, I mean, if advocacy is your, 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 your type of organizing, your calling, um, General Assembly is every year. So they're in Annapolis, um, you know, talking about bills and laws every year. Um, and then they, then you have all off season to do all of your research, get all of the stuff that you need and gather all of the people that you need to go and advocate for better laws, better different things, whether it's election year or not. Um, and if you want to connect with people who are doing that, please let me know. Um, and even outside of just advocacy and going to Annapolis, working in your communities, work with some community associations, some coalitions that are trying to provide the solutions. There's, this is Baltimore City. We have some of the most entrepreneurs and some of the most nonprofits. So you can connect with somebody that's doing something good in their neighborhood that will truly make a, a difference, so. I agree. I was just going to be quick off of what Ian said. I, you know, Baltimore City, we have one of the um, one of the best um, communities of people who are doing social justice work in the country. A lot of people don't know that. And so like there's organizations like um, Leaders of the Beautiful Struggle and they have, they put calls out for people. They are always in Annapolis. They're always pushing certain bills. If you follow them on social media, um, yeah, that's a good place to start. Out for Justice is out here doing work, um, trying mm -hmm. to get Felon, helping felons get their right to vote, um, helping people who are recently released from prison, um, their ceasefire, if you're concerned about violence. Like, I, I feel like we have to, everybody has to find a group and do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't just wait for national elections every day, every week. Get connected to a group and see how you can help um, push those agendas forward. I think all of that, um like all of the groups that have been mentioned, getting involved in general assembly and like city council and your, all of that's great. If the other thing though is also to, um, like if, if 
politics, like the idea of being involved in politics and advocacy isn't your thing. Getting involved in like communities or going into schools and like volunteering um, to like run a school club or tutor students. Like these, these are all things that are, um, even if they're not civics or like politics, they're about building stronger communities and being, being there, being present. Um, so if, if being part of an organized group is not your thing, there are still ways to, to do stuff. That said, all of the groups that were mentioned are like, and many, many more in Baltimore are doing pretty amazing work. Um, yeah. Work with them closely. So. All right. So, were there any other questions or comments? Um, someone said at the state and local level, what resources outside of the ballot, the ballotpedia, are available to get info on candidates? Um, a lack of info or state local elections can also discourage people. So, where can people go and get information? I know this like for myself when I was voting. Um, I was, there were a few times I was like, who is this again? Like, what is it actually about? So like making sure that I understood what I was either voting yes or no for um, is really important. So I see some people sharing um, some information, but also just like to our panel. Well, you can go on Saturday to uh, No Boundaries Coalition uh, because they're going to be walking people in person through, in a socially distant way, uh, through the um, through the ballot, and I'm sure Ian will talk more about that. Um, also, I learned recently that like the Pratt Library librarians, um, mm. I, they're like, you know, if you've got a question about what's on your ballot, like send an email, call the library, we can also help. Um, talking to, if you're particularly interested in like the judges, um, <laughs> There's not a lot of information about that. Um, an idea that I think has come up um, conversations with uh, Not For Justice, Nicole Hanson Mundell, who's the executive director there, not for this year, but like looking forward, there might be a drive to like get firsthand experiences from people who have uh, experience with the justice system, sort of writing reviews of their judges and making that publicly. Mm -hmm. So not not currently available but like that's something that's being talked about and if you have an idea of like how to make that happen um you know reach out to to groups sorry and no Taz, but i think that last part is the most important too like there's nothing wrong with doing that that research of like asking people asking your friends your, or like literally just not organizers but your friends the people, what do you think about this person? Have you heard of them? Have they, you know what I mean? You've seen them in community. Have you seen them at a school? Um, you want to be able to do those things. I know everybody don't have a ton of time to do all, all that all the time, but um, most of us got sample ballots in the mail and especially for like your city councils, like some of those local elections, just do a quick Google search. We Google search other stuff, me, stuff that we, we really want, uh, we really need, we want to find out. Um, just do a quick Google search, see what, see what pops up, see if they have, they have any information on if they've done anything in the community. Um, yeah, and then all of these other great resources people have, have mentioned. All right, well, um, it is 7.40 and it's a Wednesday. I'm sure people are probably like tired from a very long day and Zoom is not necessarily your favorite place. I know it's not one of my favorite places, but I definitely did enjoy having you all here with us today to talk about this topic. Um, I really want to just say just for like some parting words. Um, I, I think that vote, me personally, I think that voting is important, is an important aspect of citizen, of being a citizen. But definitely I think being out here, educating yourself by coming to events like these, getting linked up with organizations that have been kind of mentioned. Um, and then like talking to your neighbors and, and doing that work going to, you know, your neighborhood meetings, those are all ways, I think, to be involved, to change the, the world and the communities that you see. Um, it's not an easy thing. It is, can be tiring, but I think that it is necessary work for us to do um, in order to have the impact that we want to have. So whether you want to run for, you know, mayor or city council, which of course, 
if you want all that jazz on you, more power to you. Um, or if it's just simply you being involved um, in the, at the local level with just like your neighborhood and like making sure that there's trash cleanup and doing events there. Um, those are all ways, I think, to be involved outside of an election year. Um, so I want to thank you all. I want to thank our panelists, Tasman from Baltimore Votes and Ian from No Boundaries Coalition and Michelle, who is with VRJA, but she's great. Um, and I just want to thank you all for coming. Once again, um, to learn more about VRJA, you can go to our website. If you want to donate, you can see more events like these and other things. Please make sure you donate to us. Um, also, we're on Facebook. As I mentioned, we're on Instagram. Um, and we are on Twitter. So, um, and then also this will actually be on YouTube. So if you joined late um, and you want to get more information for what we discussed earlier in the discussion, um, this will be put up on YouTube and we'll be sharing that out on our social media as well. Um, Ian and um, Tazman have shared their websites in the chat. So if you want to learn more information, you can click on those links um, to see some events they have coming up. And I thank you all um, for bringing us some good questions and some good dialogue. And I hope you guys have a good a good week and good luck. See y'all. Thanks again. Have a good one. No problem. Thank you.